90 Days, 90 Reasons, number 88, Obama has worked to end the war on drug users. Anna Marie Cox is a senior political columnist for The Guardian U.S. She was a contributor to the very first issue of McSweeney's and is the author of the novel Dog Days. Reason number 88. I'm just going to take for granted that you who are reading this realize just how pointless and stupid our unwinnable war on drugs has been. A cool trillion dollars spent, countless lives extinguished, untold heartache, unimaginable amounts of human potential wasted just in terms of lives cut short, but also all the would-be Einstein, Shakespeare's, and Martin Luther King's who instead find themselves by circumstances or birth trapped in addiction, jail, criminal enterprise, or all of the above. It's the last category I want to focus on because although it's the most difficult to determine in quantitative terms, it's also the area where a president and like-minded legislators could make the most immediate difference. Obama has done a great deal and has pledged to do more. Romney hasn't just maintained a ghastly silence on the issue, but has surrounded himself with supporters whose backgrounds would indicate a throwback disposition toward the subject. What Obama has already done. He's addressed one of the most obvious injustices of drug policy by signing the Fair Sentencing Act of 2010. Until then, federal law mandated terms for offenses in involving crack cocaine that exacted penalties 100 times more harsh than those involving powdered cocaine. Someone holding 5 grams of crack faced a 5-year mandatory sentence where it would take 500 grams of powdered cocaine to receive the same sentence. And it scaled. The penalty of 10 grams of crack was equivalent for that 1,000 grams of powder cocaine. 10 years. For economic reasons, you can learn more about it, as she gives a link. Blacks are far more likely to be arrested for crack-related crimes than powder cocaine, related ones. 85% of those arrested for crack-related uh, crack crimes are black, while only 30% of those arrested for powdered are. Blacks are most likely to be arrested for drug crimes in general, in some states up to 11, 11 times more likely than whites. The Fair Sentencing Act took a step toward evening out sentencing. Possession of crack cocaine now results in sentences about 18 times as long as those related to powder cocaine. This act also eliminated the five-year mandatory sentence, minimum sentence for simple possession of crack. The law could affect, has or could affect an estimated 3,000 cases annually, reducing sentence by an average of about two years and saving an estimated 42 million over, four, over five years. One could have argued that the likelihood of crack cocaine distribution involving violence justified the continued disparity. I'd argue, however, that the likelihood of crack cocaine users and offenders being under the age of 30 justifies taking an approach that would give those with the greatest actuarial potential the most lenient sentences if circumstances warrant it. But this isn't just about keeping people out of jail for the sake of it, or even for the sake of money, though certainly it would save a lot. Reducing mandatory sentences is the first tentative step toward unraveling the knot of arrest, addiction, and poverty that binds so many. When the penalties are harsh and unrelenting, arresting a young person for a felony drug crime pretty much guarantees you'll be arresting the same older person for a drug crime later on, especially if that person is an addict, which is true for an estimated half of our prison population, including those arrested for non-drug crimes. Drug users are twice as likely to return to prison. Only about 20% of drug-addicted inmates receive treatment, despite some programs showing the treatment reduces recidivism by as much as 85%. Under the Obama administration, the meager federal prison drug treatment program has received increased funding, and there have been feints at instituting a more muscular second-chance program, though not, though not much has been really done besides making Michael Vick its poster boy. According to GQ correspondent Mark Amender, the Obama plans to do more in a second term, though what is exactly is unclear. That said, even a change in the perspective of lawmakers would be an improvement. Obama appears to be part of a growing number of politicians who are willing to recognize that not only is the war, drug war a failure, but that the only solution to the crime and misery it exacerbates is by community engagement, treatment for addicts, and appropriate consequences for abuse by casual users. What might matter the most for those victims of the war on drugs is keeping Obamacare in place. The Affordable Care Act could change the lives of thousands, of thousands, if not millions, of addicts. Right now, an estimated 23 million Americans who need treatment for the disease of addiction, less than 1% get treatment. The truth is most addicts don't want treatment, but some do. About 2 million and over a quarter of them cited inability to pay for treatment as the reason number one for not getting it. 
the Affordable Care Act addresses this particular tragedy in three ways, establishing parity for treatment of addiction as a mental disease on par with any other disease, making professional treatment an option for everyone, everyone allowing children to stay on their health insurance plans through the age of 26, thus creating a safety net for those who develop an addiction in early adulthood, and mandating coverage despite pre-existing conditions. Right now, anyone with a history of chemical dependency would be rejected from any affordable plan, no matter how much sobriety they may have accumulated or what level of commitment they've shown. The Affordable Care Act might even make a dent in the percentage of diagnosed addicts who don't think they need treatment, as well as those who don't know they have a disease, via grants for something called screening brief intervention and referral to treatment. SBIRT. That program uses community institutions, jails, emergency rooms, campus health centers as contacts for identifying addicts in need of treatment. All patients are assessed for drug and alcohol use, and if they are at risk, they get a mini intervention aimed at raising their awareness of the problem. Those identified addicts in needs of treatment get referrals. The, ACE, the Affordable Care Act makes these screenings mandatory benefit for anyone with health insurance. Romney's promise or threat, Pret Thomas, to repeal Obamacare would undo all these advances. These, there are other reasons you should be very scared of what Romney might do when it comes to drug policy. Romney has addressed drug policy in the same way he addresses every other vital question facing our country, as vaguely as possible. On the record, he is, com he is committed to expanding the U.S.'s attempts to stem, stem the tide of illegal drugs across the Mexican border, a stalemate that has caused about approximately 65,000 lives thus far, and he opposes any decriminalization of marijuana. Otherwise, he has not said much. As with the other policy issues, we must look to those close to him for hints of what might be in store, and he keeps pretty gruesome company. One of his top fundraisers, Mel Sembler, is a former owner of a chain of tough love rehabs, now defunct due to allegations of torture, sexual assault, and mental abuse. The chain's organizational structure morphed into the Drug Free America Foundation, now chaired by Sembler's wife, Betty. DFAF campaigns against the decriminalization of any drug use and against harm reduction policies, needle exchange programs, and the like. Romney himself is linked through Bain Capital to Aspen Education Group, another tough love rehab conglomerate with a history of abuse and fraud. Look, anyone who's been passionate about undoing the damage caused by the drug war has every reason to be disappointed with Obama. He's our first president who's an admitted drug scofflaw and the first to admit that the drug war is an utter failure, and he has yet to tackle any of the many decriminalization efforts that states have begun to experiment with. His drug czar, whose who's obscurity, his name is Gil Kerlikowski, is probably a sign of the administration's first do-no-harm attitude, has been less than awesome on leading the change in attitudes, but as they say in the treatment programs, progress, not perfection. And I will vote for Obama on the secure knowledge that under a second Obama term, life for those suffering because of the drug war will get better. Should Romney get elected, those lives will get worse, if only because Romney has put himself in the company of people whose attitudes have translated into policy, would drag our country even deeper into racial polarizing, racially polarizing, insanely expensive, and futile errand that probably wouldn't be a more substantial war, but a slow and steady slaughter of people and dreams. So take the time to make your own just say yes joke and head to the polls. Let's do this thing. Anna Marie Cox, St. Paul, Minnesota. Reason number 88.